Is there a Zoom or? See the R E C in the in the top. It's recording right now. If you look okay. in the top right corner, you see the R E C. Yeah. I'm I do. Okay. I'm good. Good. Live. That didn't, that didn't inspire confidence. Yeah, you're, you're live. Oh, we're live. Okay, okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Today is a new day. Today is a new week. We just started a new month. A new year, a new decade. So if ever there was a time for a new beginning, it's now. And we do that a lot, don't we? We make, at this time of year, we make the New Year's resolutions. What are some examples of New Year's resolutions? Maybe some that you've made. What's, guess what the number one New Year's resolution is? Lose weight. To lose weight. I made that one this year. Again. <laughs> what are some other New Year's resolutions? Maybe to make a, uh, a career change. Maybe this will be the year that you meet that special someone. Or maybe that's what eHarmony wants us to be. Maybe <laughs> uh, every January we see that promotion done. But, um, and you know, praise God that I don't have to make that New Year's resolution anymore. And you know, good thing too, because I was really getting sick of making that resolution year after year after year. So, you know, praise God for that. Well, how do these resolutions usually turn out? Where are you on February 1st after a month? How about <coughs> January 8th after a month? <laughs> Where were you yesterday after a day? You know, most of these resolutions, you know, kind of fall by the wayside. And, you know, and why is that? Because, well, what do all these things have in common? Losing a couple pounds. Taking a different commute to a different cubicle in a different building. You know, if you really think about it, a lot of these things are small changes. And small changes usually produce a small benefit. A small benefit, but what does that give you? Well, it really gives you a small amount of motivation to achieve it. Well, the good news that I want to talk to you here about tonight is that our God is not a God of small changes. Our God is a God of radical changes. He's about taking a murderer and making him the liberator of a great nation. He's about taking a lowly shepherd the youngest of all his siblings, and making him one of the most celebrated kings of the Old Testament. He's about taking one of the early church's biggest persecutors and making him one of its biggest pillars. Radical change. And you know, God wants to make a radical change in everyone here tonight. So, the real question is, what is stopping? You might say, you know, hey, I would love for God to make a radical change in my life. So just, just do it already. What's, what's the holdup? Well, the point is, folks, we have, we have free will. Usually what's stopping God? It's us. We can refuse God's gift if we so choose. We can, try, we can frustrate his plans for our life if we so choose. Jesus is not going to force himself on anyone. If we say no, if we tell him to get lost, he's going to listen. He's going to respect that. So tonight, I don't want to talk about a New Year's resolution. I want to talk about a New Year's revolution. Experiencing God's radical change in our lives and eliminating the stumbling blocks, eliminating the obstacles that really prevent us from experiencing God's best. And one of the biggest obstacles in my life that may be for some of you, it's worry, or stress, or tension, or whatever you want to call it. So let's talk a little bit about worry, what the real definition of it is. You know, most people would be defining it as uh, feeling troubled, or feeling anxious, or maybe feeling uneasy. 
one definition of worry would be focusing on negative events, whether they be real or imagined or possible. The key word is focus. Where you're spending your time and your energy. When we worry, what do we usually think about? You know, do we usually think about the best case scenario? No. Do we think about the most likely scenario? No, it's always what? It's always the worst case scenario. The worst thing that could possibly go wrong. You know, I'm no movie director. I've never directed a movie in my life until I start to worry. And then I'm like, away. I construct in my head the most elaborate movie possible with a cast of thousands, plot twists, special effects. You know, James Cameron's got nothing on me when I start worrying. And you know, it's not even the worst case scenario that I start imagining. Usually I make up something in my head that is so obnoxiously horrible that it's laughable. Usually something that never would happen, that never could happen. You know, Mark Twain said it best. My life has been a series of one hard time after another, most of which never happened. And you know, folks, your brain cannot tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something that's real. If you don't believe me, look at what's happening to children out there acting out the violence that they see on TV because it's so real and so vivid that they can't tell the difference. And when you start worrying, when you start playing that in your head, you start to think it's real. I was at a Promise Keepers event in the Hartford Civic Center within the past 10 years. And it was a full weekend of praise and worship studying the word and teaching. And I recall one of the speakers mentioning that some people refuse to put their faith in Christ because of worry. They worry that God will tell them to marry someone ugly. <laughs> you laugh. You laugh like it's fun. But let me ask you all this. Why is it that 10 years later, after a full weekend, of studying the word and praise and worship, that's the thing that I remember 10 years later. <laughs> Probably because there's something to it. You know, like my words, 10 years from now, in 2020, maybe one of you will be preaching and you'll be quoting me. Another definition of worry could be denying God's sovereignty. Taking God off of the throne We've always heard God is in control. But what does this word say about that? If you have your Bibles, open up to, and I'm going to do these rapid fire, um, and I'll email them to you if you miss some of them. Philippians 4 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Let's take a look at Matthew 6 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Is not your body more than clothing? Luke 12, verse 25. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? You can't. And yet we spend so many hours of our lives doing exactly that. Worry. What do all these examples point to? What does it say? Well, it points to God telling us, don't worry. I've got it. I've got it under control. So when we worry, what are we telling God? Well, we're telling God, you know, sorry, God, you don't got it. You're not in control. Because you see, God, my problems are so huge. You couldn't handle it. I know you made the universe and everything, but you got to understand, I've got bigger problems. And you know what? My problems are so unique. You see, God, no one has ever had this particular problem in the history of mankind. Nobody. Another definition of worry can be ungratefulness. It can be a failure to acknowledge God's blessings in our lives. It's saying to God, you know, I don't deserve what's happening to me. It's you comparing yourself and 
against someone else and what God has given them or what God is doing for them, and you feel like you're coming up short. You start to feel cheap. You feel like God's forgotten about you. So when you put all of these reasons together, what do you have? Well, I'm sure, as my eighth grade teacher once told me, it is a sin to worry. When you worry, you are disobeying God. Now that alone ought to be enough for us to want to make a conscious effort to root worry out of our lives. But if that wasn't enough, let's take a more practical look at it. What are some of the consequences of worry? I'm sure most of you can come up with your own. Well, one consequence of being overwhelmed with worry and stress, well, you're always in a reactive Remember, I mentioned worry was focusing on negative events and negative outcomes. When you're worrying, you are always on your guard against something negative happening. You're either trying to prevent something negative from happening, you're trying to mitigate the damage it may have caused, or you're plotting against whoever did it to you. In any case, you're always on defense. And you may say, well, you know, wait a minute. Isn't that good? Isn't it good to be on defense? Because after all, offense gets the glory, but defense wins the game. But let me tell you, folks, a win without glory is no win at all. If you're not on offense at least some of the time, you're not going to score. When you are always in a reactive mode, it is going to suck all the joy, all the fun out of your life. That's not why God created us. God did not create us to be miserable. It's okay to be happy in this miserable, corrupt, fallen world. In fact, we're expected to be happy. Well, another consequence of worry, it ruins our relationships. We've already seen it ruins our relationship with God, but it also ruins our relationship with other people. Let me ask you, what do stressed people love to talk about the most? Themselves and their problems and how terrible their lives are. I mean, are stressed people really fun to hang around with? No, not really. I mean, would, you, would you like to hang around with somebody who's stressed out and miserable? or someone who's calm and centered. It's really no brain. You know, I think of that, you know, that great philosopher who said, when you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry, be happy. It's going through your head now too, isn't it? I've had it in my head all week, now you get to suffer with me. That's your problem. You know, another consequence of worrying is it undermines our witness. You know, as we say, worry can really rob you of your joy. Peter 3.15 says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks it, a reason for the hope that is within you. If you don't have joy, if you don't have hope, it's going to show. What if someone came up to you with this, this hangdog expression on their face, kind of looking like Ray Romano on a bad day, you know, <laughs> you know this depression in their voice, and they tell you, Hi, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. As you can see, he's given me an abundant life, and he can do the same for you. Does that sound tempting? Not, not so much. Or, you know, flip it around. How about somebody freaking out with work? Especially on the college campus. Oh my gosh, I'm going to go on. I got, I got this final exam coming up, and, and, and I got to do all well this final exam. I need at least a B because I'm getting like a D minus on everything else, and this is worth 50% of my grade. And by the way, I'd really like to talk to you about the peace that surpasses all understanding that only Jesus can give you. 
You want to talk to me about my eternal soul while you're freaking out about a final exam. Why should I listen to you? You claim to have peace, you're freaking out about a test. You want to talk to me about where I'm going to spend eternity. Undermines our witness. Consequence number four is the one we're all familiar with, the health consequences. You know, we're all familiar with physical effects of stress. Your hair can start to fall out. You have trouble sleeping. You have trouble staying awake when you're supposed to. You know, and then there's a the big one, there's ulcers. You know, it used to be, when someone had an ulcer, the typical advice was what? It was lay off the spicy food, right? And nowadays we know. Now we know that if someone has an ulcer today, it's not about what you're eating. It's about what's eating you. You see, the mind and the body are connected. And if you don't believe me, think about when you've had the flu. And you're strung out on NyQuil and antibiotics and aspirin and whatever else. What kind of dreams do you have at night? Kind of bizarre? Strange, maybe even a little scary. Well, why is that? It's because your body's a wreck and it's affecting your mind. When you dwell on negative thoughts, when your spirit is constantly restless and disturbed, your body is going to pay a price for that. So, we talked about what some of the definitions of worry are. We talked about some of the consequences. Okay, so what? What do I do? What can we do to fend off excessive worry? and stress. Well, there's three things that we need to get. First, we need to get perspective. Get perspective about God. Get perspective about yourself. What can we remember about God? First, God is sovereign. He is in charge. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, you alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens. The heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to all, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Here's another example. God is our king, and God is our judge. Look at Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and it is he who will save us. You see, God makes the rules, and God enforces them. Third point I want to make, God will take care of us. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Fourth point, God requires our trust and our obedience. Of course, for both of those. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Next up, Jeremiah chapter 42, verse 6. Whether it is favorable or unfavorable, we will obey the Lord our God to whom we are sending you, so that it will go well with us, for we will obey the Lord our God. You see, when you obey God, good things come from it. When you disobey God, bad things come from it. It's a no-brainer. Next point, God loves us. 1 John 4, 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Final point I want to make, he, God wants to take our burdens. Look at Matthew chapter 11, 29 to 30. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now you notice, Jesus isn't saying, there's no yoke, there's no burden. He's saying, it's a light burden. Don't let anyone say that there's not a cost to following Jesus, that it doesn't cost you anything. It does. But it just costs you a lot more not to. So we've got some perspective about God. What can we get for perspective about ourselves? First, we are God's children. Look at Romans 8.16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Second point, we are important to God. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So 
So we know that we're important to God, but it's important, no pun intended, not to be self-important. Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God's given you. Finally, we have to understand that everyone is going to have stress. I'm not saying you'll be able to eliminate 100% of stress in your life and be blissed out for the rest of your existence. If that happens, people are going to be come to take your furniture away pretty soon. Everyone is going to have at least a little bit of stress, a little bit of hard times. Look at Job chapter 2, 9 and 10. This is where Job is arguing with his wife. His wife says to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, You were talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Remember, if there's nothing going wrong in your life, there's nothing going on in your life. So, We've gotten perspective. What's the next thing we need to get? We need to get grateful. You know, we've all heard the phrase, you know, count your blessings. Well, why is that? Let me ask you. When you feel worried, when you entertain those negative thoughts, when you take God off the throne of your life, do you feel blessed? Probably not. Uh, let me turn it around. During those times when you feel blessed, when you really feel grateful for everything that God has done for you, everything God is doing for you, even everything... God is going to do for you that you haven't thought of. When you are so grateful to God for all his blessings, are you overwhelmed by stress? Probably not. See, you can't be worried and be grateful at the same time. When you appreciate everything that God has done, you feel blessed and you feel rich inside. When you're ungrateful, you feel like you don't have anything and you feel poor inside and you become a needy person succumb to excessive stress. So we've gotten perspective. We've gotten grateful. And the last thing we need to get, we need to get off our behinds. I had an English teacher in high school who loved to say, don't anticipate, participate. Get involved in your own success and take action. If you have a problem, why not spend all that time and focus and energy that you spend worrying about the problem and actually go and solve the problem? It'll produce much better results. You know, I was in charge of a very important phase of a very large project at work a couple of years ago. And as you can imagine, there were problems popping up all over. This system isn't working. These transactions aren't going through. No chance of moving the deadline. We've got to start over in this area. And a coworker of mine, you know how people use hand wringing as a metaphor? This woman would literally actually wring her hands with worry. So this coworker of mine came up to my desk and started relaying all of these problems, and literally just wringing her hands with worry. And she would look at me with this puzzled look on her face and ask me, but, but aren't, aren't you worried? And I would say, no. I'm so busy working, trying to solve all these problems, I don't have time to be worried. Well, she resented that. But then again, she wasn't with the company too much longer either. You know, if you need to make a decision, Trust God. Trust God at His word. We've all heard that phrase, all things work together for good for those who love God. Remember the Promise Keepers event that I mentioned from 10 years back? I made a decision, and I took action. You see, I decided to take God at His word, that all things are going to work together for my benefit. And God would not make me marry someone ugly. I made a decision, and I took action. And there's my wife. Amen. Amen. You see, God wants to bless us, but we've got to do our part. We are called to cast our burdens at the cross. 
but we have to do the casting. The Bible doesn't say Jesus is going to steal your burdens away from you. No, as I mentioned before, we have free will. We have to cast our burdens at the cross. I'm reminded of an old Keith Green song. I don't know how many of you have heard of Keith Green, but he had a song and it goes, just keep doing your best and pray that it's blessed and Jesus takes care of the rest. It's catchy and it's accurate too. You know, if you often find yourself overwhelmed by worry, maybe it's time to take a break. You know, it may be a good time to take stock of your physical well-being. You know, there may be some physical problems causing your stress. If not, it's only a matter of time until some stress causes some physical problems for you. You know, I pointed out how an imbalance or a, a disease in the body can affect the mind. And you know, maybe, I know it's heresy, especially to say this on a college campus, but maybe it's time to cut down on the caffeine. <laughs> okay. Now I know, believe me, I know, I know students run on caffeine. I went to grad school while I was working full time. So hey, I'm the first person to say I understand the need for an energy boost, but there is a price to be paid for too much of a good thing. If alcohol is laden with courage, caffeine is laden with fear. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought. You were bought with a price. So honor God with your body. If you're overwhelmed by worry, maybe it's time to take a break. Get some fresh air. You know, get some exercise. I know it's a miserable day outside, and it's cold, and it's wet, but even just getting outside for a few minutes, I will be the first to say, it can do wonders for relieving stress and worry. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go out and run a marathon, like me. But I do want to impress upon you the benefits of even just a little bit of physical exercise. It's a good way to get not only a strong body, but a strong mind and a calm spirit. I started this sermon talking about God's radical change. And it's my hope that 2010, for at least some of you, can be the start of a New Year's revolution. By breaking chains of anxiety, breaking chains of selfishness, breaking the chains of sickness, that excessive worry can bring. Let's make a commitment to set ourselves free and allow God to work his radical change in us. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom and love that is available to each and every one of us at every moment of every day. Lord, forgive us for the sin of worry. Forgive us for the sin of not turning to you and utilizing all the gifts that you make available to us. Help us to use this new year, this new decade, as an opportunity to repent from our worry, to seek your face and your peace and your wisdom and your guidance and your love that we can be a light to others, to be an effective witness to others, to have an extraordinary life, the one that you planned for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, I'd like to call up the band for one last song. Hey, Bill. Good luck following that next week. See ya.